Good evening, everyone. You are welcome to continue eating uh, dessert and coffee, but uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to uh, begin our uh, highlight of our program here. Uh, first of all, we'd like to welcome our students who just came in uh, from uh, Broadview Heights. I believe that's where you're from, right? Okay. And thank you for coming. We appreciate that. Uh, this evening's speaker, <laughs> there you go. This evening's speaker really doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. He's been in the news for many, many years, and um, he started many years ago as a city or a uh, prosecutor, county uh, city prosecutor in uh, Lake County. That was in 1989, and Steve was very, very active with the environmental issues in that area with the Great Lakes and on the Great Lakes Task Force for many years as well. And then he moved on. He was elected to the House of Representatives, and he has been there for 18 years, just recently uh, decided not to be run for re-election in uh, 2012. During his time in the House, he served on many, many vital committees, including the House Appropriation Committee, beginning in 2009. Several subcommittees, uh, which are very interesting and important, were Transportation, HUD, Interior, and the Environment and Related Agencies uh, Committee, Subcommittee. And the, this part I like the best. Steve played a uh, part in managing funds for the national parks, the wildlife refuges, and uh, forests and public lands, and water resource protection, and cultural agencies, which included the Kennedy Center and the Smithsonian. That, would, that impressed me very much. We had uh, placed some uh, complete bios on the tables for you, and I'm sure uh, if uh, you look around, you may find them. I, I couldn't, we might have a few more. Okay, all right. Um, the uh, line that I thought most interesting in his bio was this one. Steve is a fiscally conservative, moderate Republican who strove to make a bipartisan and regional approach to governing. And that is exactly why we are here this evening. Please welcome Steve LaTourette. Well, thank you very much, and it's uh, great to be here. It's also nice to see uh, some folks that I haven't seen for a while. It's always nice to be with, with Mayor Lansky. Uh, when I was the 19th district, I represented uh, half of Maple Heights. You can never represent all of Maple Heights. So I represented half of Maple Heights and I got to know uh, Jeff and his, his family and it's nice to see them. And, but the big surprise for me tonight was to see Patty Astorino. When I uh, was running in my first re-election in 1996, uh, anybody that was paying attention and hopefully you weren't, but I was running against uh, the mayor, Brooke Park, Tom Coyne was the Democrat, uh, the Democratic nominee. And uh, Patty's husband was with the fire department, and, uh, as, as will sometimes happen. The, uh, the safety forces uh, in contract discussions don't get along with the administration. Uh, and, uh, and so I got this call out of nowhere from Patty in Brook Park that she wanted to put up a bunch of my yard signs. And uh, when you're starting out, uh, you're grateful to anybody that uh, is willing to put up your yard signs. And I'll always remember that, and Sean Brennan was you know, I, I, I'm glad that Sean's uh, students are here uh, because I think what we're here to talk about is, is exactly what young people should be, should be learning about. So after 18 years, uh, I made the decision to retire from the United States Congress and, and uh, unindicted and undefeated, which are, uh, are both, <laughs> which, which are uh, no small feat uh, in, in, this, in this day and age, you know, and, and uh, it was uh, a tough decision in that uh, I really believe in public service. I think that what you do on a daily basis uh, in your villages, towns, uh, is important. I thought what I did uh, was important. It was good to uh, be from Ohio at, at that moment in time because regardless of party, it never hurts to have somebody from your state be the Speaker of the House of Representatives. It's kind of a, uh, a big deal, and John Boehner's a friend of mine. Uh, we also celebrated for the first time in 2011, it was the first time that we didn't have a member of our uh, delegation, our congressional delegation, 
serving time in prison somewhere in the United States. And so that was, that was a big mo moment for us as well. But, but at the end of the day, uh, as I uh, sort of looked, and I, you know, not to be presumptuous, but I, I believe I would have been reelected in November if I'd run again. But uh, the place had become so toxic, uh, and, and the ability to, to get things done was so diminished that I, I felt that, the, and you know this from your jobs, you always have to weigh, and, and people love to make fun of people that, that serve in public office. You know, they, they say that, oh, you're, you're taking too much money, or you're taking too many trips, or you're eating too many fancy meals, or whatever the case may be, or you're, you're in the pocket of this person. But, but you always have to balance the, the, the good that you can do in the, uh, the office that people are giving you the honor to serve in with the cost to you as a person, uh, as, and whether that's a family cost or a personal cost. You always have to balance it. And at the end of the day, uh, as we rounded the corner in August of, or July of last year, I, I couldn't, the, the scales didn't match up. And they didn't match up because I had always attempted, you know, I'm, I'm a Republican, I'm proud to be a Republican, I've been a Republican all my life, but uh, I always tried to, to approach a problem and solve it. And if solving it meant that you, God forbid, had to go across the aisle and talk to a Democrat, then you went across the aisle and you talked to a Democrat, and, and you, you solved the problem. Uh, that uh, evaporated in the last Congress in spades, and it began to manifest itself in a way that I was not comfortable with. And I'll give you a, a couple of examples. The, uh, I sat on, for many years, on the Transportation Committee. And every six years, uh, you know, that uh, it started in 1991 with something called uh, Ice-T, then it was T-21, then it was Safety Lou. Six-year federal highway program. Now, the thing I liked about the Transportation Committee is we always had an expression, there's no such thing as a Republican road or a Democratic bridge. Uh, and so we were about building the infrastructure of, of, of the country. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, for those of you that, uh, I'm proud of a lot of the things that I did during my 18 years. The, the one that I, I love to drive on these days is the north part of Route 8, if you ever go down to Summit County, and when it was turned into a limited access highway. Now, that's not a Republican project, it's not a Democratic project, that just made it better for people and businesses to locate there and people to get to and from work. But this past year, uh, the bill was up and the Congress couldn't come to terms with how to pass a, a highway bill uh, for six years. And, and in this instance, I will say it was the Republicans' fault. There was a, a Republican from Florida, his name's John Micah, uh, was the chairman of the committee, uh, and he made a decision that he didn't like mass transit. And, and not to get too in the weeds, but when you get a gallon of gas, you pay 18 cents in federal uh, gasoline tax, and of that, 2.8 cents is guaranteed uh, to go into the transit program. Now, transit in, in some parts of the country, doesn't, it's not a big seller, but if you live in Chicago or Detroit or, or, uh, or Cleveland or New York, Transit's a big part of things. Uh, but what happens is the asphalt guys, the guys that make asphalt, concrete, and want to build roads, they come in and they've talked for years about how unfair it is that <clears throat> since transit doesn't contribute to the trust fund, that we siphon off 2.8 cents uh, of, uh, of the gasoline tax to go support transit. Well, it's a stupid argument, first of all. And second of all, uh, it, it's a bad argument because to, to RTA, if you talk to Joe Calabrese, to RTA, it's not just the 2.8 cents that translates into about $56 billion over the life of the bill, but they then, because of that guaranteed position, can take that 2.8 cents to Wall Street or to, to an investment house and, and bond it and, and multiply it by many, 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 many times the amount of money that they're going to reach. So they did that. They also did away with something, or proposed to do away with something called enhancements. And, in the introduction, I, you know, I, I left office with, with, we have more acres under conservation easement in the 14th District of Ohio than any other district in the state of Ohio, and I'm very, very proud of that. And I happen to believe in enhancements because, you know, life is, is not just getting in the car in the morning and listening to Atlantic and Malone or whoever you listen to and, and pounding down on a, a, an extra lane of highway. It's also quality of life. And quality of life is defined by, you know, certainly the Cuyahoga Valley National Forest, or National Park now, 
uh, and uh, the metro parks and everything else. And so when the bill was originally crafted back in 1991, there was a 10% set aside for enhancements. And what are enhancements? They're rails to trails, they're bike paths, they're walking paths. And you know, if you were to go out to Lake County where I'm from, there are some of these these hiking paths in the in the uh, when the weather's a little nicer than it is today, that are busier than a lot of the roads. And you see young people, you see middle-aged people, you see families, you see old people, all uh, out exercise. And for me, that's a, a, a decent expenditure of federal funds. But they wanted to eliminate those because, again, the argument is from the asphalt guys that that takes away from from uh, building that you know fifth lane on I-71, so we can. You know, only take two uh, and a quarter hours to get to Columbus rather than two and a half. And uh, so the bill was designed in such a fashion that, that no Democrat would vote for it, which, which you can do uh, when you're in charge. Uh, when you're the majority party in the House, you can craft a bill that the other party doesn't like and you, you don't count on any of their votes. But it's then incumbent upon you to produce the winning margin, 218 votes on your side. Well, this bill was such garbage that we couldn't even muster 208, I couldn't vote for it, and a lot of my friends couldn't vote for it, because it, it just was not going in the right direction. So after years of bipartisan work on a highway bill, we couldn't do a highway bill. We came to the farm bill. Now, if you look at me, you can tell I like to eat, and, and a lot of people like to eat. And what's partisan about a farm bill? Uh, but again, because the farm bill contains a portion of the SNAP program, which uh, it used to be the welfare program, but it's the, it's the nutrition program. Uh, people don't like the SNAP program. Uh, and those people principally are on my side of the aisle. And so they wanted to make uh, significant cuts into the SNAP program. Uh, and so as a result, you're not going to get any Democrats to vote for it. But then you also have people that come from areas where people are in need that think the SNAP program is pretty well run, as is the WIC program and others. And so they couldn't produce the vote, so you don't have a farm bill. Uh, it culminated, you know, you always have these epiphanies. And, and for me, it culminated, you may remember last June that there's a lot of budget gimmicks going on in Washington. But one of them was uh, when, and this is, I'll blame this on the Democrats, when Mrs. Pelosi was the Speaker of the House, they crafted a bill and they needed a pay for. Uh, and the way that they got the pay for was to build in, in June of 2000 and 12 that the interest rate on student loans would double from 3% to 6%. Uh, and it's a, it's a budget trick. I, I don't think any Democrat that supported it really was in favor of student loan rates doubling. But we got to, we were coming up to the deadline in June, and we couldn't agree. Everybody in the Congress, 435 people, thought that that was a horrible idea uh, to make it more expensive to finance the cost of a college education. But we couldn't come to terms with how to fix the problem. And so uh, my epiphany came when John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, went to the floor and gave the shortest speech I've, I've ever seen him give. And it, it basically was, do we have to fight about everything? And the answer, sadly, is yes. I, apparently, we do have to fight about everything. Uh, and uh, as long as that's the attitude at the, the national level, uh, and if that then is the attitude at the state level and the local level, it, it, we're really going uh, in, in the wrong direction. Now, a couple of comments. We were talking at dinner, and I'll tell you why I think it's happening at the federal level and why I think it's happening at the federal level has to do with, uh, with uh, redistricting, uh, at least in the House of Representatives. Uh, and uh, I said this during dinner. This Congress will, be, uh, will go down in history, this new Congress, uh, as the Congress with the least amount of, of uh, swing districts, competitive seats in, in history. And so out of 435 uh, House seats, there are only 32 uh, that are uh, potential toss-ups where a Democrat might beat a Republican or a Republican might beat a, uh, uh, the other party. And, and, and the reason is, as redistricting has been controlled by the state legislatures, and if the state legislature is, is under Democratic control, they draw districts that favor the Democrats and vice versa for the Republicans. And so districts are now established in such a way, they're so red and they're so blue that it, it is impossible in, in over 400 districts, almost impossible. It's, it's, <clears throat> it can happen if you have a tidal wave election, 
It can also happen if the, uh, the incumbent is uh, embroiled in some sort of scandal. Uh, that may do it. Uh, the expression in Washington is if they're caught with a, uh, a, uh, a live sheep or a dead girl, I suppose that they, they could lose. But absent that, they're going to perform reliably for one party or the other. Now, what that means is that the challenge that, that the incumbent has isn't, isn't to respond to the voters in November. It's to make sure that, that they hew either enough to the left or enough to the right to not get a primary challenge. And, and uh, a couple of examples, and I'll use Ohio, which just went through the redistricting process. So you may have heard there's a congressman by the name of uh, Jim Jordan, who's from Western Ohio, pretty conservative fellow. Uh, and when redistricting was all done, his district is, a, is an R plus 18. Uh, now, what that means on election day, uh, he, as his base vote, is guaranteed 68% of the vote. Uh, now, and so if that's what he's facing, he has more incentive to get up every day and feed red meat to the Republican base than he does to find consensus within his district. Because his challenge is going to be someone from the Tea Party is going to run against him from the right and say that he's not a good enough Republican. Uh, conversely, on the Democratic side of the aisle, and I'll, I'll talk about my friend Marcia Fudge, uh, that district, the east side of Cleveland, is a D plus 36. That means that Marcia can sleep in on election day because she's guaranteed 86% of the vote. Uh, no matter how good the Republican candidate is, uh, how well financed, uh, what the issues are. And so Marcia's challenge is to make sure that she keeps the Democratic base happy uh, within her district so she doesn't get somebody running against her to say that she's, she's not a good good enough Democrat. And we saw this in the, in the 2012 races, and I, I think what, what's different from when I started in, uh, back in 1994 is that you not only have uh, Republicans and Democrats don't think alike on issues, and nor should they. All, both parties have honestly held views uh, that uh, are in their DNA, they're in their makeup. And so you always had conflict between the parties. It was much more civil when I started than it is today. But what you didn't have is, is people within your own party shooting at you. Uh, and today, uh, with the advent of these super PACs and other things that have sort of uh, uh, come to the fore, you, I, I'm, I'm a rhino. And so, you know, uh, if, if you were talking to a conservative Republican, they say, well, that's Latourette, he's a rhino. And, and you really have to peel back the onion and figure out what, what is a rhino. First of all, I've been a Republican for 58 years. And, and that's based upon the fact that if you look at my record, I have cast votes that were not anti-labor organizations. I, I happen to, I never remember reading anything when I was growing up that in order to be a good Republican, you had to hate organized labor. Never, I never saw that. And, and then the other votes where I went astray was on the environment. And having grown up uh, with Lake Erie in, in my front yard, why wouldn't you want clean water and clean air and things like that? But the, the, the criticism is that I then am a rhino. And we saw it in Pennsylvania. There were two, two uh, who, great people who I got along with. Uh, one, Timmy Holden, who was a former sheriff near Hershey, Pennsylvania. The other one, Jason Altmeyer down in the Newcastle area. They were taken out in the Democratic primaries, and the challenge, the attack on them was they weren't good enough Democrats. They weren't, they weren't hewing far enough to the left, and so they were defeated uh, in in, uh, in the primaries. And so, the, so my new non-paying job, the job that I'm going to embark on uh, for the next little bit, is to head up something called the Republican Main Street Partnership, and. My first act as president was to take the Republican out of the name, and it's now just known as the Main Street Partnership. Uh, and it's to provide uh, aid, comfort, and, and a safe haven and protection against people who choose to uh, advocate governing from the center rather than from the right or the left. Uh, and it's something that I strongly believe in because the country is in the center. And, you know, Pendulum swings back and forth. I would argue that the Democratic Party was in danger of losing its way uh, in the Michael Dukakis, uh, uh, Mondale era, and it wasn't until Bill Clinton 
and the DLC brought things back to center, that that party is now robust. And now my party is sort of swinging out with the Tea Party people. I know that Ted Cruz is down the street. If you get bored with my speech, you can go see Senator Cruz down, down the way. Uh, and and uh, we're in danger of being marginalized as a national party. There is not one Republican member of Congress from all of New England. And, and what I w would always challenge my, my, my uh, colleagues was, how can you be a national party if you don't represent the entire nation? And, and some of the positions that we adopt are swell for if we were trying to elect the governor of South Carolina or the governor of Texas, but they're not working out so good if we want to compete and elect a member of our party to be the president of the United States. Uh, and so my challenge, uh, and friends of mine, uh, are to try to bring my party back to the center. This, this is, I believe, a center-right country. Uh, that's where most people are, and that's where we should be um, attempting to govern. I want to just talk a little bit about uh, sequestration, the fiscal cliff, and, and the mess that uh, is Washington. I, I don't know how anybody, I was sitting next to Paul and he's in business, I don't know how anybody can be in business today uh, with the way that we have conducted ourselves in Washington, D.C. And, and by that I mean from going to crisis to crisis to crisis every two months, every six months, every 90 days. How can you, how can you figure out your life? And, and how can you figure out what's going on in your cities and villages if you don't know what the taxes are gonna be, if you don't know what the regulations are gonna be, if you don't know what the health care costs are gonna be? How, how can you engage in any planning? But so much time is spent on making sure that the other side doesn't get a leg up or making sure that you preserve an issue to, to smash the other side over the head. As a result, we, we miss what we should be engaged in, and that is what's good for the country. Not, what, not what's good for me, but what's good for the country and how do we get out of this mess. And this mess, quite frankly, $16 trillion is what we owe. It's projected to go up to $22 trillion. And I don't know what a trillion dollars is, but I know that it's a lot of money and 16 is 16 times a lot of money. And, and what you're gonna see is eventually the inaction and the inability of the parties to solve the big problem are gonna, it's just gonna choke the life out of everything that we believe in, that we want the government to be involved in. <clears throat> and the reason I say that is if you look at the, the federal budget, $3.6 trillion, uh, and so you consider it to be a pie, 2.4, trillion goes out the door without any member of Congress casting a vote. Uh, and so that's Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the interest on the debt primarily. So you're left with a pie that's a third of the size, $1.2 trillion. Of that, half is defense, $600 billion. And so the remaining $600 billion, if you think about all the things that the federal government does, education, the environment, you, you pick a program, it comes out of that $600 billion slice of pie. And, and what has happened because, quite frankly, the President and the Congress will not challenge their parties on their ideologies, all of the pain has been borne by this little slice of pie. And so as a result, if you look at things like transportation, transportation has gone down 27% over the last two years. If you look at a bill called Labor, Health, and Human Services, and that, so that takes care of all of the social programs funded by the government, it's taken a 24% cut over the last two years. Now, the only way that you get around it is if you're a Republican and you say, you know what, I grew up when the, there were stories about the $600 toilet seat and the $800 hammer, and I'll bet out of $600 billion, we could find some savings at the Pentagon. And if you are a Democrat, you have to say to yourself, you know, when Social Security started in the 1930s, the life expectancy in this country was 63. Today it's 79. It was never designed in its current iteration to support somebody in retirement for as many years as they contributed into the system. And now that I'm, you know, not in public office and I don't need anybody to vote for me, when I go to a senior center, I say, look, you guys were supposed to be dead before you got Social Security because life expectancy was 63. But 
the fact of the matter is that, that you can do things without all the horrible consequences of slashing benefits and doing all this other thing. And if you don't, you really are contributing to the destruction of Social Security and Medicare because you're not making sure that they're there uh, for uh, the people that, well, the kids over here. You know, they did a little survey of high school seniors and they said, what are you more likely to see, a Social Security check or a UFO? More high school seniors picked UFO. Uh, and that is the way that we should be running the country. And so as we look at this sequestration thing that's, that's bubbling up, and the reason that I've been so actively involved in the Simpson-Bowles stuff, but you know, let, me, let me tell you about Simpson-Bowles. I mean, so here's President Obama's fiscal commission. They come up with a set of recommendations. Not one of them has been implemented. I put it on the floor during the Ryan budget last year with a Democrat from Tennessee by the name of Jim Cooper. They call the roll, there's 435 votes. We got 38 votes. 26 Democrats and 12 Republicans. That's disgusting. And it's because nobody wants to go home based upon whether they live in a red or a blue district because it put everything on the table. And so if you're a Republican, it put revenue on the table and said, we're not gonna get out of this thing just by cutting spending and doing this and that and the other thing. We have to have more revenue. Federal government's operating on the lowest percentage of, of uh, revenue as a percentage of GDP that it has since 1959. You can't explain that. I mean, you just can't, that, that's not a, a reasonable argument. But on, you know, we got this guy Grover Norquist, everybody, you know, sort of signed pledges and, and you know, if you don't keep the pledge, you, know, you lose an arm or something and something horrible happens to you. Well, you can't be afraid of Grover Norquist. Grover Norquist has never been elected to anything. Uh, and we got a big problem and we got to save the country. And likewise, if you're a Democrat, then AARP runs these disgusting ads. And they're disgusting because I gotta tell you, I've not heard anybody in Washington come up with a proposal that would do anything to change a benefit for anyone 55 and older. And so when the senior citizens start calling in and say, oh, you're talking about messing with my benefits, and the AARP ads say, oh, it's gonna deprive these people. That... No, it's not. No, it's not. What it is saying is to, to these people, the young people and the people in their 20s and 30s who have 30 or 40 years to go between now and, in, and retirement, we're a smart enough country to figure out how to make sure that those programs are solid and sound fiscally for a longer period of time. But you know, they all have, they all have expiration dates, you know, and everybody, everybody romantically thinks, they say, oh, when Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, they'd have a beer and they'd solved all the problems. Well, those of you that have served in government for a while know one of the ways they solved the Social Security problem in 1984 was to put in the, the, uh, the government pension offset and the windfall tax. And what they did was they did the math and figured out there weren't enough public employees to cost them an election, so let's screw them and we'll go out and say we save Social Security for everybody else. Well, those are the false choices that, that people shouldn't be making because they're, they're not permanent. If you look at the payroll tax, we had a big dust up with the president over the payroll tax, the 2% payroll tax. And so to get it reauthorized, a lot of people didn't report on it, but how did it, how did it get paid for? It was paid for by assessing people, young people primarily, who wanted to go out and get a mortgage backed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, more fees on the mortgage. And not for just 10 months, which was the, uh, how long the payroll tax got extended for, for 10 years. And your cities, your businesses, your families would not be able to operate if you continued to finance 10-month projects with 10-year money. And that's the problem we find ourselves in. And, and honest to gosh, I, I, uh, it, it really is time uh, for people, you can disagree without being disagreeable. That's the art that's lost. Uh, and, you know, I, Again, one, one of my best friends in the Congress, he's now a big famous star on Fox News, uh, Dennis Kucinich. You know, and, and, and Dennis, I'll say this gently because he's my friend, Dennis is nuts. I mean, when, when, when it, he, he believes some things that only Dennis believes. But you know, I love the guy and he loves me. And when it came to things here in Northeastern Ohio, we could, we put all that stuff aside. And we figured out how to, how to make it happen, how to make it work. Because that's what people expected of us. They, they didn't, 
you know, expect us on the inner belt bridges to wander into town and, you know, me to blame Dennis for it not being done and him to blame me. But, you know, sadly, that's, that's where many, many uh, uh, people are now finding themselves. And I, I, think it's, I think it's unfortunate. And so my new career, if you will, is to, uh, for people who want to get together and try to solve the problems, not, not to become bad Democrats or bad Republicans, you know, because some people think that working together uh, means that uh, I'll, you're bipartisan if you do everything I ask you to do. Well, that's not bipartisan. Bipartisan is that if you have 10 things and you can come to terms with five of them, that it's better to come to terms with those five and then go fight about the other five tomorrow than it is to say, well, since we can't do all 10, we're not going to do any of them. That, that, that's really counterproductive. Now, <clears throat> I'll tell this story and I'll ask, I know that we have some members of the media and people who blog in the audience, and I'll, I'll ask their respect in this, these remarks. But there was, a, there was an election uh, for the, uh, a pretty high office in Ohio that the person goes to serve in Washington. And I came in to, at uh, his request to serve as, uh, to pretend I was his opponent uh, during the course of debate preparation prior to the City Club debate. And so, you know, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, and there, there's a question on Asian carp. And, and the question is, Asian carp, big problem. I mean, <laughs> Asian carp, like me, eat about 40% of their weight every day. And if they get into the Great Lakes, it's going to be a, a big problem. Okay, well, so the question is, what about Asian carp? Well, this, this fellow launches into a five-minute answer about how President Obama is to blame for Asian carp because he won't confront his cronies in Illinois, at the Illinois River, and because he won't shut down that waterway and he doesn't care about the Great Lakes. And, he, and I, I, when it was over, uh, I, I just, as gently as I could, said, you know what? In, in this business, there are gimmies. And there are some things that have no root in, in partisanship. And it is okay if you give an answer that it doesn't blame President Obama if you're, if you're a Republican, and it doesn't blame John Boehner if you're a Democrat, uh, and just say this is a big problem, and we've got to work it out. Uh, and we have to come together and figure out a way to keep this horrible fish uh, out of the Great Lakes because of the, the damage that it's going to, uh, uh, the damage that it's going to inflict on us. But, you know, that isn't what his handlers were telling him. And, and so as a result, everybody is so afraid that if they give an inch, it's going to be seen as a, a sign of weakness that you're, that you're caving in. Uh, and that, that didn't used to exist when I started. Uh, I, the other thing, I, would, I don't know how often you're able to interact with each other outside of the council chambers, but I, I, really, I really think it's, it's important that people get to know each other and get to know each other's families. Uh, people always make fun of Congress because we go on these junkets, Ooh, junkets. Uh, but, but I will tell you that with the, the drive to get back to your district every weekend and every day you're not in session, the, when you're stuck on an airplane uh, for 8, 16 hours with somebody and their spouse, you get to know them. And the next time you're engaged in a debate with that person, it's a lot harder to call him a jerk or a name or something nasty if you know the guy's wife, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, Sally was nice, you know, and so, but that's been lost. And so, you know, maybe your, your schedule, uh, because you're all here, gives you the opportunity to, to mix uh, on outside of, of the council work on a more regular basis. And I, I really think you need to do it uh, and, and, and spend time doing it. Because I, I've always believed <clears throat> that the job that you have and the job that your mayors have is a whole lot harder than the job that, that I had for 18 years. Because, you know, when, when somebody's got sewage backing up in their basement, they, did, they never called their congressman. Uh, they call you, and, and they want you to fix it. And, and they want to know why you didn't fix it already. Uh, and, and so as a result, you know, and even though some people would disagree, sewage is not a Republican or a Democratic principle. Uh, and, and so that's where you, you, know, you need to, to work together. The other, th the other thing that's different, and then I'll close and be happy to answer any questions you have, 
is, is that people now are, when I was growing up in Cleveland Heights, we, we'd watch Walter Cronkite. And we'd sit down and we'd watch him come out at 6 o'clock. We saw what happened. We'd go about our business, come back the next day at 6 o'clock and, and see what was going on for half an hour. Today, with the 24-hour news cycle and the blogosphere and all the other stuff that's going on, pe people are gravitating not, not to sources to get information, to be informed about what the facts are. They're gravitating towards outlets that are, reinforce what they're already thinking. Uh, and so it's like an echo chamber. And so if you're a Republican, you're all supposed to go home and watch Fox News. And, and at the end, you know, you, you go to work the next day and you say, hey, well, I'm right because Sean Hannity said I was right. Uh, and if you're a Democrat, you sort of gravitate to CNN. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're a communist, you watch MSNBC. But that's... <laughs> I'm only kidding. They're, but but people, people, people move to where they're going to get positive reinforcement rather than, uh, rather than uh, uh, getting educated. So uh, I don't know how we fix it. I, you know, as far as the Congress is concerned, I've used the example a number of times that perhaps it has to be like the alcoholic that hits absolute rock bottom where they have no choice. Uh, there is no out. There is no wiggle room. There is no 60 or 90 day extension that's going to save the day. Uh, but, th but that's not... That isn't who we should have uh, in charge. Uh, last thing, I am so excited to be at this dinner now because, and this is really an example of the dumbing down of, of what we do for a living, public service. So a number of years ago, <clears throat> the brainiacs in Congress determined that, that you could corrupt me by giving me a hamburger. Uh, and so they changed the rules to say that, that if I go to an event, that, I'm free from it now, but if I went to an event in Washington, uh, you could give me food as long as I ate it on a toothpick. I could have a uh, no silverware and no sitting. I could have something to drink as long as I consumed it standing up. Uh, and so, those, so to be able to sit down with silverware and eat a meal has been great this evening. <laughs> but but the, the idiocy of that is that if you wanted to invite me to the Capitol Grill and give me a $5,000 campaign check. I could eat silverware, I could eat the fattest steak in the world. Now, how stupid is that? And, and, and it really is, I mean, we're to blame as elected officials because we continue to permit the dumbing down of what it is we do. Uh, and, and when you dumb down what it is you do, you know, and, and in Congress's case, I was thinking about Newt Gingrich actually started it. People have been running against Washington for a generation. And I'll bet if I spent 20 years uh, attacking you, your approval rating might be 13%. Uh, and, and it really, it, it's incumbent upon us in elected office to stand up for ourselves and, and say that we're not in this to get rich. I, I don't know how many of you have gotten rich being on city council. Uh, and, and we're not in it because the hours are great. Uh, we're not in it because the travel is sweet. Uh, you're in it because you want to do something for your community. Uh, I started uh, years ago on Cleveland Heights because I, I thought you can either sit on the couch like Al Bundy and complain about it or you can go do something about it. And I know that's what motivates everybody in this room and that's uh, and we need to tell people that when they when they make fun of us. So anyway, I, I, uh, I'm depressing myself but I'm very happy <laughs> to, to be here and uh, if you have questions, I'm, I'm ready to answer any, anything you got. Thank you. Uh, we would ask that anybody that has questions, please come up to this microphone and address your question to Mr. Latourette. Thank you. No. Uh, my name is Harvey Brown from the city of Bedford Heights, and I'm, certainly I'm so pleased to see you. Thank you. And certainly to hear your comments, and also to hear of your moral value that you still share, which is certainly something that for many of us, because you are the example that those of us on the local level follows. That's not, true. not only local, but also on the state level. But seemingly, you know, I can remember growing up, and if I met a congressperson, I felt like I had hit the jackpot. Oh, yeah. Because there was a certain amount of respect that went with right. that. 
and 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 the word of, of anyone in office really meant something. The same as with your teacher. Yep. You can always remember your teacher's name. Yep. But now it seems that as far as the moral value, the moral standing, the commitment to public service is something that is as foreign as if you were to go to another country and ask them to understand the American ideal. Mm -hmm. So I ask you, and certainly you can answer it or not, yeah. with your moral values and the things that you have told us today, what has happened to those of your colleagues, whether it be Democrat or Republican, that certainly know the difference between right and wrong, certainly know the value of caring for the least of our brethren, where did it start to go wrong? Now, there's a perception that under President Obama that a lot of this started when he became the president. Right. Whether that is true or not, for those of us who, who are not in Washington, we hear the perception. And the perception is, for me, if I believe it, it's real. Sure. So, what would be... Yeah your comments if you choose to answer. Yeah, no, I, thank, I, you. I, I, thank you, and I'm, I'm happy to answer it. And to, to boil down the first part of your question, I, I think you're saying it's not such a big deal to meet me, <laughs> what the, <laughs> if, if I understood you correctly. Uh, but, but, uh, but, but, you know, you're right. I mean, I, as, as a kid uh, growing up, and it, it went beyond when I was out of law school. I mean, I, I remember the first time I met Dennis Eckert. I mean, I thought, man, this is really cool. Uh, that I'm getting to meet Dennis Eckert, and uh, you know he's someone I still have contact with and uh, and, and respect. And you know now uh, most people when they would meet me really don't think it's a, a very big deal. I, I would say that that the it's two things. Uh, one is it, it's what I said before, and that is for 20 years people have been running against Washington. Uh, and and uh, two is people are more concerned with getting reelected than they are with, with doing the right thing. And, and when that becomes, you know, your objective, and in the House of Representatives, you, you, I have to, you'd have to layer in one more, and that is they're such leadership-driven places that, that the, the pressure on you to go along, to get along, is, is really intense. And, and you know, I, I made the decision early, and I know poor Boehner, he got yelled at all the time because of my behavior, but. I said, you know, what are you going to do, kill me? I mean, you can't kill me. And, and you didn't put me here. The people in Ohio put me here. And so I'm going to vote in a way that I think most of them want me to do most of the time. And, and, and that's lost. Now, I've heard, I've heard the observation that this started <clears throat> in 2009 when, when the president was elected. I actually think that it, it started uh, back when President Clinton was the president. Uh, and if you went back in time to the Monica Lewinsky thing and the impeachment and everything else, you know, I, I would go to, to talk to, to audiences and, you know, some Republicans would come up to me and say, I, I hate Bill Clinton, you know. And, I, and my answer then, and it's the same today, well, you may not like his policies, you may not be crazy about some of the decisions he's making, but you don't even know Bill Clinton. How can you hate Bill Clinton? And then there are Democratic friends of mine who would come up and say, I hate George W. Bush. Well, same thing. I mean, you, you cannot be crazy about some of the decisions he made, but how can you hate the man? I mean, you, you can't hate the man because right or wrong, he's doing what in his head he thinks is right, as was Bill Clinton, as is Barack Obama. Uh, but, but it is this, it, it's this taking of a disagreement over policy and personalizing it. And you see it in campaigns. I mean, campaigns... Are not, they're, not, they're not conducted anymore about if I'm a Republican and you're a Democrat and here's the issue that we put out what we believe and what we would do if we were elected. And, and now it's, I hope I can find a picture of you, you know, in some compromising position so I can, I, I can make a 30-second ad about it. Or, or I hope that I can go down to the recorder's office and find out you didn't pay your taxes so I can, I can talk about that. Uh, and, 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 you know, people always say, well, I hate these disgusting uh, ads, these negative ads. Well, the day that people stop letting their behavior be affected by the negative ads is the day the negative ads would stop. Uh, but as long as people that, that make a lot of money consulting on campaigns are able to go to their clients and say, you, you really, 
you know, you really have to talk about, uh, you really have to talk about uh, this bad stuff that this person is doing. And, and my view is, if it doesn't relate to the, the job you're running for, I mean, there are some things that people do bad things that do actually relate to what it is they're trying to do. But it's, it's, those are the problems. But, and, and so now you have people who have dug in and who have said, you know, I hate Barack Obama. Well, I've actually met Barack Obama. I happen to like him. I mean, I, and, and as a person, I don't, that doesn't mean I agree with everything he wants to do. But he's the president. And, and it wasn't my job to, to say he has to do what I want, just like it isn't his job to do. But, but I think it is the pressure to, to get reelected. I mean, some people, and, and, and this again, we were talking about term limits at the table. Term limits are the dumbest idea I ever heard of. Uh, and particularly in the Congress, because what, what you wind up with, uh, and all this pay business, you, you wind up with people that are so filthy rich <coughs> that they really don't need the paycheck. And, and, and who wants just a bunch of people, filthy rich people representing you? Or you get a group of people that couldn't get a, a job if their life depended upon it because their skills aren't so great. And, and what's missing? What's missing is the middle, where everybody else in the country is. And that's, the Congress should look like the country. And uh, so that's, that's the best I can tell you. And it's not everybody. I mean, look, look, I, I gotta tell you, of 435 people, I believe 425 of them have pure hearts, Republicans and Democrats. Uh, and if, if they didn't somehow feel that winning the next election was the most important thing in their lives, they would behave differently. I have a question. So yes. first of all, I would like to say thank you very, very much for all the years of uh, service you gave the country. Thank you. Thank you. I, for one, was very sorry to hear you uh, that you were leaving, but yeah. totally understandable. Um, so my question has to do um, with something completely different. I'm going to talk about that veggie burger you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, actually, I was here in this building with Dr. Esselstyn mm. from the Cleveland Clinic who uh, is featured in a movie called Forks Over Knives. Mm. So I'm going to bring up a, a very tender topic for everyone because it has to do with what we eat. But mm. he made the statement that um, changing our diets would, could drop our um, health care costs by 70 to 80 percent in this country. Yeah. And as you're saying, people are living to be, you know, 10 years older. Those yeah. last 10 years are very often fraught That's with expensive. very expensive medical bills. So yeah. um, was he correct or incorrect? What's your sense of our, the health of our nation and what that's costing our country? Well, I, I, that's a great question. I, th I think he's right on the money. And, and, you know, my grandmother used to say that we have things bass backwards. And, and what I mean by that is when, when I got to the Congress in 1995, and actually here's a, a good thing that Newt Gingrich did, he took a look at Medicare, and, and if you think about all the people that have diabetes in this country, I bet everybody in this room knows somebody or has a family member that's uh, been affected by diabetes. So the Medicare program was set up in such a way that they wouldn't pay for nutrition education, they wouldn't pay, uh, you know, how did you keep your sugar under control? But if you got gangrene, we'd pay for a prosthetic foot. If you went blind, we'd get you a guide dog. Uh, and, and so it, it, it was bass backwards. It was completely upside down. And if there's a good thing that's going on, slowly but surely, that, uh, that is reversing in public policy because people do recognize that the, the bulk of health care costs are in the later years of life. And, you know, everybody's going to die. You know, everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. But it, if, if you can make sure that you're not setting the stages for those chronic diseases with a goal towards everybody dying in bed you know, of a heart attack and, and, or whatever, just closing your eyes and going to sleep, that, that's where we should be about. And, and, uh, and, and that's why when the nutritionist used to come lobby me in Washington, I, I always felt, you go. Because if, it starts at home, it starts in school, and if you can teach kids how to eat. But, I, I should tell everybody else the reference is uh, the Kuciniches come to our house in Virginia on a pretty regular basis. And this past summer, Dennis and Elizabeth came. And I was, I got a big grill, and I was doing dogs and burgers and steaks and everything. And <clears throat> Dennis and, and Elizabeth are vegans, of course. And they brought these soy burgers and, and asked me to grill them up for them. And 
I said to Dennis, I don't even know when they're done. I mean, what is it, what is it, what is, what's it going to look like? And, and he, he said, just, just put some grill marks on it and, and we'll be fine. But, but you know, to, to that point, uh, you know, Den Dennis, uh, when I used to ride back and forth with him on the airplanes, you know, the, wait, the flight attendant would come by and what do you want to drink? And I, I'd take a Diet Coke and he says, I want a cup of hot water. And uh, the flight attendant thought he'd lost his mind, but he pulled some tea bag out of his pocket and put it in there. And so to his credit, I, I think he's probably a lot healthier. I know he's a lot healthier than I am. So yeah, well, you make a good point. Um, oh, yeah. hello. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, I'm Mary Dunbar. I'm a member of Cleveland Heights City Council. I'm also the president of the Heights Bicycle Coalition, hmm, nice. trying to make Cleveland Heights more bicycle friendly. And I see if I can state this question in an intelligent way, which is, um, do you think that the balance between what we cede to the federal and maybe the state government as well versus the local government is right? And um, I'll just give you an example. When I first, uh, when the Bicycle Coalition first formed, one of the things we wanted to do was improve uh, Edge Hill Road, which goes between Cleveland Heights into University with. Circle. Yep. It's the most, one of the most traveled bicycle routes in Northeast Ohio. And it's full of potholes and so on, and part of it's in Cleveland and part of it's in Cleveland Heights. Right. And um, so in order to get it fixed, we've been through two years now of planning with NOACA uh, for how to improve the connectivity between Cleveland Heights and University Heights. Right. And um, we haven't even gotten to the stage, well, we're getting to the stage of doing engineering studies, and then we'll do implementation. And along the way, lots of bureaucrats and consultants have been employed. But it seems like if we, I mean, what, what we knew what we wanted to do from the start. And if we just had had the money and somehow could come together, we could have done it. So sometimes it seems to me like we need national standards, but not all that control, uh, which is, I think, trying to equalize, make things fair or something between um, people with different amounts of monies in different cities or something. Is the balance right? How do you get the balance right? Do you have any impressions from all your years in Washington, D.C.? I don't think the balance is right now, but I'd yeah. be interested I, in your opinions. Well, I, I uh, actually, my dad lived on Washington Boulevard after my parents were divorced, so I used to go down the Edge Hill, hill all the time because it's a hill and I never had to break a sweat. I just went down the hill. Um, <laughs> But I, I think, you know, that, that question is at the center of most of the debates that, that are legitimate in Washington today. And that is, what is the federal role versus the state and local role? And do we need a national standard? Do we have to have federal preemption to clear the field? And it, it's kind of interesting that, you know, Republicans are known as primarily as state rights, Tenth Amendment people, and, 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 uh, and the, uh, the Democratic Party is more known for a stronger central federal government. But people flip on, on the, depending on whose ox is being gored. And, and so, I, you know, I've seen, I've seen Republicans give these great impassioned speeches for a stronger federal government, and Democrats say that we need more, more local control. It is out of whack, and I, I, but I don't think in the short run, and, and one of the problems with, with federal involvement is, it, here's the money, but here are the 25 hoops you've got to follow through if you're going you're gonna to get the money. Uh, and and you know on, on what you're proposing, I, I just don't I, I don't I don't know why, uh, but that's the risk you run anytime you take federal money or the the little strings that uh, that are attached. And no, it's out of balance. But I, honestly, I don't know how how you get it back because they, you know, the, the federal guys have to feel they're relevant. And how are they relevant unless they're controlling your life? You know, <laughs> and 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 uh, you can put strings around it. But. Um, it, it's, it's why, uh, one of the reasons that, and, and a program that's done pretty good work in Ohio, when we did the highway bill in 1997, we created uh, state infrastructure banks. And state infrastructure banks, because of their disconnection with direct federal funds, don't give you the whole panoply of, of uh, federal requirements that you would have on, on something that came out of FHWA. But I, I, I can sympathize with you, but I, you know, I, I think that that the, the time between idea and road construction is about 15 years in this country. And it doesn't need to be that way. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Johnny Warren. I'm council president of Oakwood Village. Uh, quick question. Most of us are here have four-year terms. Right. And you seem to get a lot done at least every two years right. because of the fact that the third year, right. people are starting to look at showcasing or right. some anyway or right. looking about being reelected. Yep. Congress only has two-year terms. Right. So they continue to run from one year to the next. Right. And what is your take on, and they have the shortest terms, right. what is your take on Congress having four-year terms so that at least two years there could be the possibility of a more a bipartisan environment right. and maybe getting things done? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great question, and, uh, except now that I'm retired, I want them to run every year as opposed to <laughs> but, 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 but it, it's, I'll answer it in two ways because that's what we do in public life. But um, I, I always marvel at the genius of the Founding Fathers and the way that they set this up. Uh, because the President's at four years, the Senate's at six, and, and the House is every two years. And the, and the, and the thought process was that the members of the House needs to, need to be the closest to the voters. Uh, and so as a result, we tend to be more rambunctious uh, and, and, uh, and sometimes goofy and, and so forth and so on. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, maybe that was a model that worked back in, in the 18th century. Uh, but today, you, I mean, you're right. There, there are, before, the, the guy that took my place, David Joyce, great guy, former prosecutor in Geauga County. Uh, but before he was sworn in, there's a guy sending around emails that he's going to run against him. Well, you know, so, so you don't have two years. He didn't even have a day, uh, you know, to, to do what he was supposed to be doing. And, and so the, the constant campaigning, and that then ties into the civility argument because the reason that, that members have to jump on the plane the, the minute they've cast their last vote to get back is to raise money so that they have enough money to, to run, uh, you know, uh, in, in two years. Uh, and now that this primary thing that I was talking about is on top of that. Uh, so uh, I don't know how you do it because I, I was a McCain-Feingold supporter, but I'll tell you that, that that's just screwed things up worse, I mean, with the super PACs and some of the other organizations that are, that are out there. So I, I, I don't know how you do it, and there's a, there's a uh, Supreme Court case, Buckley versus Vallejo, that says that, that uh, money is speech. And uh, until you alter that and you figure out a way to fairly uh, take all the money out uh, of, of these races. I, I don't. I don't think it's going to get any better. Uh, and and uh, that's that's unfortunate. But you know, I, I'll say this: that when I say fairly, what what always happens is somebody will come up with an idea, and that's not fair. It, I mean, it's it's designed to 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 help one side or the other, and and that's what I'm talking about. I, I you really. All these issues have a sweet spot. Let me talk about guns for a minute because we didn't talk about guns yet. Now, if you look at these horrific shootings and the Newtown shooting in particular, all but one of these mass murders have been committed by a, a young white man in his late teens, early 20s, with untreated mental illness. And there is a way to get at that without having to, to give up you know, if you're a Second Amendment supporter, you don't have to give up what you believe in. And if you don't want any guns in the country, I mean, you can continue to work for that. But th there is a sweet spot where, where you could actually do something that was good for the country. A and my personal view on that is that uh, I've been to gun. How many of you have been to a gun show? How many of you have ever been to a gun show? Okay. Well, <clears throat> those who want the background checks at gun shows some of them, really don't want background checks at gun shows. They don't want any gun shows. Because if you've ever been to a gun show at the IX Center, so there's a guy selling guns at a table. You buy the gun from him. If you have to wait five days, he's in Cincinnati at a gun show. He, he, the, the, so it effectively kills the gun show. So if, if your position is there should be no gun shows, great, you can have that position. But if, if your position is we want to keep guns out of the hands of people that shouldn't have them, well, the way to fix the problem is, and I, I don't hear a lot of people talking about it, but if I were to buy a house tomorrow, I'd go to the bank and get pre-approved for the mortgage.
So if you want to go to a gun show and buy a gun, go get pre-approved to, to show that you're not crazy and you haven't been convicted of a crime. And, and then you go to the gun show and you buy the gun and said, here's my pre-approval. But instead what happens are that the Brady campaign, you know, pushes that we have to have assault weapon bans and this, that, and the other thing. And the NRA, you know, uh, talks about how the president's children have protection at, at, at school. I mean, and so it breaks down into the, the, the no surrender mentality that I think I've been talking about. And we got to get past that. And, 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 and we should be about fixing the things that we can. It's like the serenity prayer. I mean, <laughs> let's do the things we can do uh, and then move on. You know, my students over here know that in class um, that uh, I'm a big government geek, uh, like everybody in the room, and, uh, and, I, and I try to balance with the kids here in the media, which we all know the media's uh, um, motto is, if it bleeds, it leads. Right. And so we all have this negative view of the word politics. Right. Um, and, and they do. They have a very jaded view of politics, like many people in the public. Um, so I try to balance that out, but it's becoming harder yeah. uh, because of what's going on in Congress. It, it's hard, you know, I, we talk about how the Founding Fathers built this country on compromise and how compromise, unfortunately, has become a dirty word um, because you're compromising your beliefs. Um, so what I'd like to hear a little bit more about is what your organization, uh, uh, what you plan to do with your organization. And, and I'm hoping that the Democrats, my party, uh, we'll come up with a similar organization to support Democrats who uh, who feel the same way you do about partisanship and, and bipartisanship, yeah. right? <laughs> well, well, you are taking the word Republican yeah, out of it. We, so. we did take it out, but there there actually is. There's a group called Third Way, uh, which is uh, it's led by a guy named Ron Kind, who's a Democrat from Wisconsin, uh, and they uh, and there's also a group called the New Democrats, who are the the center centrist Democrats. But what you find is, if you look at these, these swing elections, the people that get wiped out in these elections are the centrists. <laughs> and, and, and if you think about it, it makes sense because, you know, again, you look at the 14th district that I represented. So uh, Senator McCain beat President Obama by 700 votes in, in my district in 2008, and it was flipped by about 1,200 votes. President Obama beat uh, Governor Romney in that district. That district demands that the person act normal. Uh, and and <laughs> if you, if you want to take the view that you're going to be hard right or hard left, you can win one election, but you're not going to win two elections because that isn't the, uh, the, the makeup of the district. And so what happens is that when there's a Republican wave, like in 2010, all the centrist Democrats get wiped out. Uh, and then, if, and then if you go to, to 2012, then a bunch of, we, the group that I belong to had 53 uh, centrist Republicans. 13 of them lost in this last election. Uh, and, it, and it's because the, you know, again, these people in the safe seats, they're a little bit like editorial writers in that, you know, they, they sit up on the mountain and they watch the battle unfold and, and then they sort of write about it and then they go down and they slaughter the wounded. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's kind of what happened. And, and, uh, I'm sorry. Just, just the way I feel about editorial writers. Um, but that, that's the problem. But, but there is. There's a third way, and we actually have uh, had discussions to team up with them. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I think this budget thing has to be done. And so jointly, we've made a commitment that we're going to stand behind anybody who wants to get us to the big deal that involves hard choices for both sides, but heals the nation. And uh, so we're going to work on it, and we'll give it a shot. The hook, the hook is coming. Excellent. <laughs> well, I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with you. and. Uh, if you ever need a, a dinner speaker to come and depress you again, just call me, and I'm, I'm happy to come. But thank you very much.